struggled with assessment of abdominal pain and at times find it daunting and you're not too sure of yourself, then you've arrived at the right place. So let's see if we can make the process easy for you. So first we will set some parameters. This is mainly a talk about history and examination of abdominal pain. It assumes that there are no obvious diagnostic aids available and the patient has not had a scan of any sort. Um, so the objectives are that you get a handle on clinical presentation of the abdominal pain so you understand it better and that you would know what to do next, whether, it, whether the action required is immediate, urgent, whether the patient can be seen as an outpatient or whether no further follow-up is required and the patient can be discharged. There are three sections to this. First, we will briefly talk about pathophysiology of abdominal pain because this is crucial to understand. Uh, then I will provide a simple algorithm of likely diagnosis. And finally, there will be a section on cases and pitfalls. So let's look at the pathophysiology first. We know that the GI tract develops as a midline structure, as foregut, midgut and hindgut as shown in the picture and each section has its own artery. The celiac artery is for the foregut, the superior mesenteric artery for the midgut, and the inferior mesenteric artery for the hindgut. It is important to recollect this information because the abdominal pain follows exactly this principle which is set up early. So the foregut pain is in the epigastric area, midgut in the panomblyphal and hindgut in the lower abdomen. This is an interesting picture and I'll come back to this uh, and I'll let you guess what uh, what this is. So what are the types of abdominal pain? Now the, there are two main types really. The visceral pain which is conveyed by type C nerve fibers. It is a diffuse type of a pain. Patients can't localize it very well. It may have a bursting character to it or a burning character to it. Uh, and it may also be referred dependent on the nerve supply and where the organ originally developed. This is in contrast to the parietal type of pain. So the parietal peritoneum is very richly innervated with type A nerve fibers and these are transmitted through the dorsal column in the spine and this, is, this area is very richly innervated so any pain is immediately transferred and the and the person is made aware of and it is very well localized and it has very typical signs of guarding rebound percussion tenderness um, and rigidity of the overlying muscles right now the, the typical case is appendicitis so the first uh, that the patient becomes aware of it is when the organ swells up and the visceral type C fibers are activated and the patient gets epigastric or, or panoblycal pain. It's usually panoblycal because it's a midgut structure. And the patient then vomits because again, the type C fibers can uh, cause uh, that site of a, a reaction. And when the appendix actually gets inflamed and now is in contact with the parietal peritoneum, the pain shifts to the fossa and then you get the typical signs of appendicitis. So this is a, a, a very um, dumbed down picture of the pain nerve fibers just for, for everyone to understand how these two pain types are different. So type A is a parietal pain, it's sharp, precise location, it's instrument and type C is a visceral type pain, it's lower transit, it's vague, and may be associated with distension. So the visceral the visceral innervation uh, is throughout the, the GI tract in, in the various organs. The type A parietal uh, innervation is mainly in the parietal peritoneum. Okay, so how do we assess abdominal pain? So there are some basic questions you have to ask yourself, and this is the key. The first question is, has the patient bled, or is, it, is the patient likely to bleed? Is this pain colicky in character? Is this parietal? And we never forget the rectal peritoneum or the referred pain. So let's see. Uh, about bleeding because that should be the first concern in any abdominal pain and I'm not talking about bleeding from the GI tract which is obvious. So the patient you should be able to discern these features as soon as you see a patient who's pale, breathless, tired or has tachycardia that should immediately alert you to the possibility of intra-abdominal bleed or bleeding elsewhere and you should elicit a history of trauma or whether the patient's had an operation whether or not there's anticoagulant uh, a history of likely pregnancy or testing for that and of course very importantly abdom abdominal aortic aneurysm 
spontaneous bleeds do occur, but they are less common. Um, but again, that should also be at the back of your mind. Now, this is a key question in understanding abdominal pain. Is this colic or not? A colic typically is rhythmic pain, which comes on in waves and makes the patient uncomfortable. The patient has to move around a bit and the, patient, the, the pain is not relieved and may sometimes be associated with vomiting. A key type, a key um, example is an impacted gallstone as shown in the picture. So why is this question important? It's important because colic means pain in a, in a hollow organ and there are only three um, main systems in the abdomen which are hollow. It's the GI tract, the ureter or the genitourinary tract and the biliary apparatus. So colicky pain cannot arise anywhere else. So the key question of whether this pain is colicky or not is important for you to settle earlier on in the history taking. Now each of these um, sites have different pain characters and they are very very uh, obvious. So the GI tract say the, the small bowel or the large bowel will have a central abdominal pain so where the hindgut starts, uh, the descending colon will have pain lower in the abdomen, uh, stomach uh, and so on will have pain in the gastric area as will have the pancreas and, um, and the gallbladder. Now the gallbladder will have pain on more on the right side, the bowel tube will, the patient will have pain more in the gastric area and radiating uh, to both the flanks. Hence, just by this simple question, and I have to really put emphasis on this, um, you would be able to make out what it, what is possibly going on with the patient. Now, is this pain parietal? Now, coming back to this picture, so this is a rather fuzzy picture of a very famous London surgeon, Hamilton Bailey, author of uh, Bailey and Love, uh, textbook of surgery, who is observing the patient's abdomen, looking for signs of movement with breathing. So hence, if the patient had peritonitis, then the abdomen doesn't move very much, i.e. he's checking for parietal pain. Now, this is peritonism or peritonitis, and typically the patient will tell you that they felt every bump, they don't want to move around, they just want to lie very still, and when you examine them, then there is guarding and percussion tenderness. This is really important, again, to differentiate this, um, because you need to know whether this is local, i.e. it's a localized process, or whether it's general, because obviously the generalized, uh, generalized tenderness, rebound and guarding is indicative of peritonitis to a serious condition. Now we're coming, coming back to the areas where this pain can occur. So let's just see, there's a gallbladder. The gallbladder can get inflamed and, and irritate the parietal peritoneum there, or it could be the appendix and you could have right eye fossa pain and all the signs, or it could be a diverticulitis on the left side or left-sided appendix that is sometimes called and then you'll have localized signs over there. You can have a ruptured uh, peptic ulcer earlier on and that can cause just epigastric pain. Uh, there will be tenderness guarding percussion tenderness. Now it's important that when checking for rebound please never just poke into the patient's belly and then pull out. That's extremely painful and it's unnecessary. Uh, here's a list of uh, various causes of abdominal pain according to the quadrant uh, of the abdomen. So just a quick recap, what have we learned? Uh, we have to first discount bleeding in the abdomen, then we have to decide whether or not it's a colic. Then the next question is whether it's a parietal pain, is it peritonism, is it generalized or is it local? And we never forget about the rectal peritoneum and the referred pain. There are some important caveats to remember. Firstly, Aortic aneurysm is frequently confused or missed entirely and labelled as uteric colic. Uh, this has uh, caused a, a lot of lives to be lost. Uh, so must always remember aortic aneurysm, especially beyond a certain age. The hernial orifices and incision sites are not routinely examined for strangulation. Early pregnancy is missed and hence the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy is not entertained and there are other features associated with pregnancy such as a torted ovary uh, etc are not also routinely thought about. At extremes of age the signs are not as obvious as in the, uh, in the other age groups and one must be uh, alert to this. 
Now, uh, the question about pain relief and whether or not if you're the first responder and seeing a patient with abdominal pain, whether you should provide them with pain relief or not, please, in every case, just provide the pain relief. So let's just quickly run through some cases for you to think about and I'll provide answers at the end of the talk. So case one, 72 year old with groin to loin pain, quite significant, moderate to severe, he doesn't look too unwell and when the urine was tested there was a little bit of blood in it. Case two is a three year old who was vomited, uh, had some vague abdominal right sided pain but after she vomited she now feels well and she's now playing about and now you've gone in and examined her and there's some vague tenderness with just very vague guarding in the right side. Case 3 is a 56 year old lady with new onset uh, irritable bowel type symptoms. She's been in and out of primary care multiple times. Everyone's getting a bit sick of her. She has a bit of change in bowel habit. She's lost a little bit of weight and more recently she has become borderline diabetic. Her ultrasound scan did not show anything obvious and all her blood workup was negative. In this case, in the case 4, the 32-year-old woman has fallen off a horse about three days ago. She's come in mainly with left shoulder pain and she had a bruised left lower rib cage. Doesn't look too unwell and just looks a little bit bored and just wants to have some painkillers and go home. Case 5 is a 26-year-old woman who comes in with right eye fossil pain, looks a little bit pale, pain was colicky, but has a very dull, constant, severe pain in the background. Finally, for chronic unrelenting, unrelenting pain, you fully investigated it, no cause was found, and if the pain lasts longer than a year, then, yeah, yeah, you can think about that. So, conclusions, abdominal pain has predictable behavior pattern, and if you get it right, i.e. you start applying some sort of a system to it, more often than not, you will have a good idea of what's going on. You have to trust you again. Uh, you will get experience and the more experience you get the better you will become. And always follow up on patients on whom you have made an initial diagnosis once they've been fully worked up and have had CT scans to see how that matches up with what, you've, uh, what you thought the problem was. And if you're not sure uh, then always just pause and ask for help, um, ask another colleague or refer a patient appropriately. So that's the end of the talk. I'll now just show you very quickly the worst outcome scenarios for each of the case I presented and these should be at the top of your list. So you always make the worst assumption with worst prognosis and then you work backwards from it. Thank you very much.